uh, shortly. Finally, in the forward swing, the type one swing is what I would call, and other people have called, a unit swing. So since it's becoming, since it's coming from very far back behind the body this way, it tends to be trunk dominated, and as the torso rotates, the arm is just kind of going along for the ride with this thing. It's a very circular motion. Okay. The type two swing is what I call a mild multi-segment swing, which is to say that even though all that trunk rotation is still there, but the pattern of that trunk rotation is slightly different in terms of the timing of the hips and the upper torso, which I'll touch on also. Um, but we're starting to see some independent motion of the arm, which is to say that on top of this trunk rotation, the arm is starting to pull through on its own and accelerating through the torso rotation. And the extreme of that is in the type three swing here. So this is very much a multi-segment sequence swing. And by multi-segment, I mean torso and then arm pulling through the torso with aggressive independent arm motion from the shoulder joint. Comments or questions? Yes, sir. No, it's not less aggressive at all. It's just like, it's, you have essentially, and, I, and my system gives me the capability to measure the rotational speed of the hips and the shoulders. And I can see how those two relate, what those speeds are when they peak, and the speeds are pretty similar. The timing is different, and I'll just mention quickly since you asked this question. On the type three swing, the hip rotation tends to be, uh, the, the hips tend to accelerate earlier, and they, then the duration of that speed increase doesn't last the entire thing. So it's much more of a burst of the hips and then a sequencing of the upper trunk following, as opposed to the type one and type two swings that tend to be hips and shoulders rotate a little bit more in unison, and then they tend to keep their speed up all the way through. So it's a boom, boom, boom thing in the type three, whereas everything's kind of working a lot more. So thank three is a much more explosive thing. Okay. Other questions? Have you related that to offer And I haven't personally. A lot of people haven't. And in fact, the next factor in golf is the relationship between hip rotation speed and the shoulder rotation speed. And it's like one of the most critical factors in the sport of golf. Anybody that has the capability to measure this kind of stuff calculates this X factor. I call it the T factor. But I haven't related it to golf. Okay, um, so what are the mechanical observations of the slides we just looked at? Decreased lateral range of motion in the backswing. Is that clear? Okay, the lateral component goes away. That means there's also a decreased overall range of motion. Obviously then, with this smaller swing size, it's gonna take less elapsed time from the time that I break the unit turn to like contact the ball. And we'll talk more in detail about that, but I think that has obvious advantages. And then finally, we noted that there's an added use of independent arm motion from the shoulder joint. Questions? So I think you'd be pretty safe to say that the type three swing is pretty much the staple of the ATP forehand, okay? What's being used on the ATP tour? So here's just a selection of a few guys and I estimated using John's video uh, when the forward swing starts. And I think you can see that all of these guys kind of have this position where the racket's outside of the hand and a little bit above the hand, outside and a little bit above, boom, boom, boom. Now, there's differences because these guys all have well, their own flares to this. And there is gray areas in here where there is room for personal interpretation, let's call it. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, but for the most part, the base mechanics package is very uniformly used at these highest level forehands. And our goal today is I'm going to explain to you the physics of how that thing works, which I think is an important thing to understand if you're trying to teach it to someone. You need to understand how this thing works, or it's very difficult to build this into someone's game. 
the big mechanical implications, um, again, you know, some individual variations are evident, but virtually all the three, uh, type three forehands seek to minimize the range of motion in the back swing and optimize the arm and hand path in the forward swing. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as we move into these next couple slides. So let's just take a look at uh, how Roger would execute the backswing in a video form. So here's his setup. Here he's making his unit turn at about this point. He's going to start breaking into the descending portion of the loop. So this is, I use Roger because I consider him the closest to my model of what the optimal forehand <coughs> is as I understand it right now. So here's the, here's the elbow, oh, oops, sorry. I borrowed this mouse, I'm not really this stupid. <laughs> okay, so here we go here. And um, elbow elevated around the body, and I know we're looking at a back view, but typically in this position, at the unit turn position, that elbow would be uh, um, away from the body by about 45 degrees, okay? Now you'll see a lot of players that come out higher than that using the type three swing. But that tends to be actually a flaw in most respects. So if you can come out at about 45 degrees, notice his elbow is pulled pretty much in line with the trunk. Now this is in contrast to his service returns that he had where he doesn't pull the elbow back so far and it's a much shorter version of what we're gonna talk about here. Elbow in line with the trunk. Notice his form is essentially parallel to the baseline and the racket head's pretty much vertical, okay? So it's elbow in line with the trunk, 45 degrees, and the arms pulled back so that the forearm is parallel to the baseline. Now that's a more aggressive pos position than is typically thought of in the unit turn. Most people think of the unit turn as pretty much even with the body. And this is the position at which you're gonna be moving to the ball. This one, not so much. This one's more aggressive. Most of these guys are pulling that, off, that racket and hand back further for a cleaner entry into the descending portion of the loop. Any questions about that? It's kind of a critical piece to this puzzle. Okay, from that position he hit there, then he's gonna go into the descending portion of the loop. And notice how wonderfully simple this is. If I could get the mouse to work. All right, here we go. Basically, this is nothing other than an elbow extension or straightening of the elbow with the elbow position constant, okay? So in other words, from this position that he attained, he's doing nothing other than just straightening the elbow to put the hand in this position. He does it artfully, it's rounded, and it's not choppy. But it's the simplest possible motion that you could have to hit this position, okay? And this is the setup, really, for the type three swing and what we're gonna talk about. Questions about that? So when you were talking about the beginning when you were thinking about that swing, mm -hmm. do you think that that part, like in the beginning when the kids are young, mm -hmm. and I don't know, you would know because you filmed a lot more kids and stuff, mm -hmm. do you think that the back swing ends up um, becoming more compact as the speed of the ball and they get older and are able to so it's more like an evolutionary thing right. as it, yeah. Um, well, this is where you get into the coaching interpretation of it. My feeling is that that's something that you should start to teach right away, okay? Other people think that this is a matter of strength more so than range of motion and that you should wait till someone develops the strength build in this stroke first and then let this one evolve as it did in all the people that I showed you on the screen. But what we're experimenting a lot at, at Rick's Academy is, okay, what, what if you build this in? Is it really a matter of strength? Or is it a matter of technique? And can you build it into younger players? In other words, can you skip some of these steps Type one, type two, type three. Can you skip, skip step two, and can you go from one to three? And the answer so far, I think we've been pretty successful in answering that is yes. But that's a co that's a, a coaching decision that each individual coach. Yes, sir. Are you pushing females into type three? Yes. Young ones. But on the tour, they're not there right now. They're not there right now. So your kids are in type three. Yes without question from day one. 
it's working with me, and I believe Rick would attest to that too. Yes. How does that translate if, if he's closer to the baseline, taking the ball and taking the ball higher? Okay, okay so there. Okay, so and taking the ball higher because now. If I, yeah, so there's adaptations to the basic mechanical patch, package that I'm going to describe today. The adaptation for the one you described would be twofold. The elbow would be lifted to a higher position initially so that the hand would come out at extension higher. And I probably would have them pull not back so far so they have more of a three-quarter take back, right. which is really what John was showing you on the service return. Make sense? Other questions? All right, let's roll. We got some stuff to get through here, folks. Okay, so I said that this was the key position in the ATP, I'm sorry, the type three forehand, um, the arm and the racket orientations at the end of the backswing. Um, they set up a very direct, clean path of the hitting arm, and we said there was independent motion of the arm to pull through the trunk rotation or pass through the torso rotation. That gives us several really nice things. One, forward positioning, oh, I hate this one. Forward positioning of the arm approaching contact. What that does is it enhances, and I'm gonna talk about this, so I don't let this one freak you out. It, it's gonna enhance partitioning and isolation of joint rotations. So it's splitting up the joint rotations into producing either forward or vertical racket speed. And if you have a question about that one, hold it until I talk about that in just a second. Here's a big one. John alluded to this thing called the stretch short, shorten cycle. Everybody's talking about it. What the heck is it? I'm gonna give you an answer, and I'll tell you what we can and can't figure out about it. Utilization of neuromuscular enhancement mechanisms. How can we make the muscular system produce more force, or the same force in a more efficient way? This arm setup, right, I'll get this before we're done, guys. That arm setup right there with the hand to the outside, to the hitting side and the racket to the outside is what allows us to take advantage of that scenario. And finally, the independent motion of the arm, which is obviously important to racket speed, um, and the relatively linear motion of the hands allows us to optimize the acceleration of the racket in the forward swing. Those three things combined can allow us to take a shorter motion half as long and generate more racket speed with it. And it's not a necessarily a strength thing, it's a technique thing, okay? So. so let's talk about this uh, thing of partitioning and isolating joint rotations. I call it here the key to the heavy ball. This is one thing in the ATP or the type three swing that allows them to maximize both ball speed and ball spin. More circular motions are not capable of doing this as easily. They generally have to maximize speed or spin. But one of the attributes of the type three swing is that the arm is pulled through the trunk rotation and typically positioned more out in front at contact like this. What that does is it allows me to cleanly partition where I want my racket forward speed and vertical speed to come from exactly what it does. So my horizontal or forward speed is going to come from leg drive to pelvic rotation to upper trunk rotation to shoulder <coughs> joint motion that on this slide I call non-twisting rotation. Okay, everybody with me on that? It's the arm passing horizontally like this through the trunk. Those are my forward speed generators on a type 3 swing. What's the vertical one is twist rotation, which is simply an internal rotation of the shoulder joint, is solely, not solely, but primarily responsible for creating a vertical racket speed. And what's the implication of that? Those two, by definition, do not interfere with each other. Shoulder non-twisting rotation gives us <coughs> forward racket speed. Shoulder twisting rotation gives us vertical racket speed. That allows us to maximize both speed and spin. And that's why you get the heavy ball associated with the type three or ATP slang. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, so John had alluded that the, the spin's coming from the pulling up of the shoulder 
And you're saying your studies are showing that it's more of the, the we'll call the wiper motion or the, that, 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 that shoulder the, the, internal rotation. Okay. That, okay, now. What I learned from Brian was that trying to get the spin from the rise was less efficient than what he is saying. Yeah, so now we're talking, okay, so Roger here uses what we call straight arm, forehand, straight arm, forehand. Straight arm, forehand. I don't want to get a lot into the depth of this, but that is the one that intensifies the delineation. Here. Okay. The double bend that John was talking about still gives you that same effect, but because the upper arm is not as parallel to the court, now the internal rotation of the shoulder kind of contributes both to vertical and to horizontal. So you're really getting the, the vertical effect of the internal rotation, but it's not quite as clean a partitioning. So in a stroke like that, they may supplement that with a little bit of shoulder lifting, and that's why you see that. Can we also say that this method, the type three, is gonna be a much faster motion from? Yeah, so the benefit of using shoulder internal rotation to generate your vertical racket speed is that the internal rotation of the shoulder is one of the faster rotations okay. in the body. And by the way, it's not forearm, it's coming from the shoulder, ladies and gentlemen. So you see the forearm coming over and people are going, yeah, it's pronation. Well, no, it's not. It's being, it's done correctly. The genesis of it is at the shoulder joint. I turn the shoulder, sorry, and because the forearm's connected, it rolls, <laughs> but the motor's here. And you need to remember that when we get to this muscle mechanic stuff. Yeah. Is there any correlation between uh, grips and using that straight arm that you're talking about? Um, you know, the straight arm. If you're asking me if it's possible with any grip, I'll say yes. Okay. It's complicated by a continental grip for sure, although I can do that. <laughs> I'm pretty old. Um, Eastern grip. The, the, really, the difference between the grip structure is not how the whole mechanism works, it's how the wrist has to be used to manipulate the effects. Other question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it is increased use of the shoulder internal rotator, so players have to be prepared for that. Um, a lot of this we're going to get from free elastic return of energy, so it's not that stressful unless they're doing it incorrectly. That's why I've got to tell you that you got to understand this to teach you. Can you hold that one? <laughs> Well, the ball impact will create instantaneously a deceleration of the racket that starts the process and then and that finishes off with the ball up. Some bigger than others because they have more acceleration than others. Seem familiar? Yes. I was just curious about tennis elbow on the one handed backhand with a bent elbow creates a lot of tennis elbow that hyper extend the arm. Is that not more strenuous on the elbow? On one handed backhand? On a, no, on the forehand. I'm saying on the one handed backhand. Oh, more strenuous on the fore, on elbow? Right. When um, you it's more strenuous extend. on the elbow if the arm is not pulled through, which we're talking about on this slide, and in fact it comes out this way. Then the forces absorbed through the contact will be um, realized as shear forces against the elbow joint. But if the arm is positioned forward, it's actually safer. Yep. Other questions? Moving on. Here's an example of the opposite case where the arm is not pulled through. Now you can see in this case where the, now the upper arm is more horizontal to the court. Now if I do that same shoulder internal rotation, it's going to make my racket go forward. Or on the type three, it makes it go up. Wow, now that changes everything. Okay, so now the shoulder non-twisting rotation might give me, so the shoulder non-twisting rotation isn't gonna give me much forward, period, but it's gonna either give me forward or vertical, and then the twisting rotation is gonna give me the forward racket speed, and so now I'm left with really kind of an ugly choice, which is I can maximize speed or spin, but not both. Question. Okay, so let's talk about this compact swing. Wait, um, set him up. 
the, the time period of swing is very, very compact. Um, obviously, that de decreases its execution time. That has huge tactical advantages. Um, and it's probably necessary in the fast-paced game today, which is why it evolves in some. It's starting to evolve, evolve in others that it previously has not evolved in. Well, that was not. Um, but range of motion is a default choice for the human muscular skeletal system to generate and or racket speed. You give a kid a racket, you say hit it as hard as you can, and they're not going to have a nice compact swing. They're going to go to West Texas, as Rick would say, <laughs> and just sling that thing. Give me a running start, too. I don't want to have the whole thing run. <laughs> right? Okay. So how do we reconcile these things? Well, the big question has always been, so is the range of motion from this huge swing replaced by strength? Legitimate question. And strength obviously plays a role. I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, this four-year-old little girl is going to hit it like fed. I mean, obviously not. Strength does play a role. However, what our research is showing and our experience on the court is that uh, the most important mechanism really is muscle performance optimization derived from technique. Don't let this one freak you out. Everyone talks about the stretch shorten cycle, okay? What the heck is it? It's a chain of events. If we consider this as a muscle, and this obviously is a very simple representation of a muscle. It's got two ends. It's got some contractile protein so that when I say contract, the muscle shortens. That's what muscles do, okay? And then it's got some kind of springy elements that are like tendons and stuff like that that have a little bit of an elastic component to them. So the idea here is that I go, number one, brain commands muscle to contract, okay? So the muscle tries to contract. But if I can create a situation where technique forces the uh, muscle to actually lengthen, okay? So I'm trying to shorten it, but the muscle's getting longer now I can put that muscle in extremely forceful conditions. Extremely forceful conditions. And at the same time, I can get that muscle up to full tensile strength before I really need it to execute the motion. And I'm going to give you an example of this in a moment. <laughs> okay, so I say, I say shorten, but this thing, th these two ends actually get longer. <laughs> okay? If I do that, then I've got the muscle in good conditions. That also kind of lengthens these springs out, I think everyone would agree. Does that make sense? So if these two ends, this one and this one, are getting further apart, those springs are increasing in size. I can use that as elastic return in the motion. Um, also, as this thing is forcefully lengthened, it starts engaging little sensors in the muscles that are going, this ain't quite right. So I'm going to send that information to the spine, and it will make that muscle contract even harder. That's called the stretch reflex. You walk down the street, you roll your ankle, your body will automatically adjust. Same thing. Overall, if I can create this situation where I say contract but force the muscle to lengthen, then when the muscle actually shortens later, it can shorten with much greater pulling force. Estimates vary from 30 to 50% greater force. So we consider that muscular optimization, and if you think about it, I'll give you an example of this in a minute, but if you think about it, you use this in everyday life all the time. Your body is good at this, okay? We've identified a lot of places where it can be built into tennis strokes. John, can you help me for a second? Absolutely. So here's, the, here's kind of the idea. So I have a bicep muscle here. It's not nearly as strong as it used to be. In fact, it's pretty wimpy at this point. <laughs> but um, uh, if I contract that bicep, it makes my elbow bend, right? Okay. So if I say contract and bend, contract, it should bend, but if he forces it to lengthen, I'm trying to contract, but now he's forcing that muscle to lengthen. So that's this condition here, right? So then if he pulls that hand back all of a sudden as I just push me down, see how my arm just snaps up? I get that for free. If you can build that into tennis strokes, you're, got, you're getting somewhere now. And we, uh, now I'm going to show you where you build that into tennis strokes. There are actually many places. We'll just look at the biggest ones. Let's look at early forward swing, shoulder joint rotation, critical to independent motion of the hitting arm pulling through. 
So basically, as these guys come out of uh, the descending portion of the loop, I've said it's very compact in terms of not going to the lateral side. But guess what? It's actually pretty extended back towards the fence. So they're maximizing really backward front motion and eliminating the lateral component. Well, if you do that, so that now you've got, here's the, here's the racket. Come on, pointer. Here's the racket relative to hand, forearm, and shoulder, uh, upper arm. So I got a whole ton of arm and racket away from my shoulder joint. If I do that right, when I engage the legs and the hips and start to rotate the upper torso, this thing's going to lag behind a little bit. And when it catches up, it's going to just swing through like crazy. That's the most direct example of use of the stretch short cycle as a mechanism. So it's all about preparing and get in the right position and engaging those hips with that blasted acceleration that I was talking so about. The position of the rack is forcing the stretch short cycle out. The position of the arm and the racket. So as I'm stretched out here, as I engage, a force is being placed on the arm, and it's like this big massive hunk of whatever fat at this point, but for most people, muscle. <laughs> and so now that thing's just going to come back like this and stretch back. You watch these guys hit with his high def, high speed video, and you'll see that arm sling back for a second, and then bam, come through. Simple to get it. I could show you an example of a, or kind of, I got to start moving along here, but I could have him hold my arm here and I'll engage my hips and my arm will probably come out of the socket. I mean, you can get the arm in front of the torso with zero muscular effort, all from elastic return in these stretch short cycle components. All of it. But you've got to really know what you're doing on this one. I call it the slingshot accelerator. You guys like that? Yeah. <laughs> All right, here's my, uh, uh, so this is what I was just saying, in a back view, okay, so really, from a back view, it's um, um, leg drive, um, pelvic rotation, upper trunk rotation this way, um, puts a force on the arm in this direction, and the arm kind of lags back and then slings through. Everybody okay with that? Okay, let's look at uh, my favorite subject, the dynamic slot, of, AKA the flip. Okay, this is what we were calling the flip before. Sorry. Um, here's the idea behind that. Because of this position that we get at the end of this swing, and because of the timing of the trunk rotation that I mentioned before, I'm going to use that hip rotation and a little bit of a turbocharge from the slingshot to apply a force to the grip from my hand that's pointing essentially forward, right like this, okay? So if I drive the hips and I use a little bit of shoulder motion and, and, I, and I really accelerate the hand, then it's gonna create a rather large pulling force on the butt end of the racket. Is everybody okay with that? If the racket is positioned above the hand and to the outside of the hand, which by definition was our position in the type three swing, right? Then that rack will rotate op opposite of its initial orientation. So if it's like this, and I put a force on it like this, that rack is gonna tend to rotate back this way. Everybody okay with that? The rotation of the racket or the flip or the dynamic <coughs> slot or Joe or whatever you wanna call it, is being caused by the pulling force. It's not being created by me turning the arm. And you have to understand that. If you don't, you cannot teach the stroke right. Yes, sir. Is this easier on the smaller grip? I didn't understand you, sorry. Is this easier when you're using a smaller grip? Smaller grip? Yeah. That shouldn't make any difference. Other questions? So, is the wrist involved in any of this? No. The wrist will passively go back, especially, listen, listen, it will go back. This is where the grip, the actual grip you use makes a difference. Okay, so in the flip, in the flip, I'm pulling, the racket's going to rotate. I'm going to tell you what we're targeting here. But in some conditions, you do want the wrist to actually lay back slightly, but that's not causing the flip. What's causing the flip is the force of the pull. 
And I'm letting the force of the pull rotate my racket and using it to preload certain muscle groups. <coughs> Seen from a side view, essentially this force pulling this way, all we can really see is the downward rotation of the racket. That's used for positioning the racket below the ball and a little bit of a stretch shortened cycle. And I use the term loosely, we're not sure which of those components works, but we know it does of the forearm, internal ropes, uh, forearm pronation musculature. <coughs> so it's a little bit, boom, preloading of this. Racket rotates, stretches these muscles out, and then if I need to use them, which double benders do, I'm not going there, but I'm just gonna say it, then I can return that faster. Everybody with me? So I've applied the stretch shorten cycle now in two positions. But the cool one is, if you look at this in a back view, Here's that same force from the hip rotate, leg grab, hip rotation, upper trunk rotation, turbocharge of the shoulder, all that stuff. Here's the force in a back view. Now because that force, the racket head is outside, seen in a back view, so seen in a side view, you'll see this. You'll see it come down like this. In a back view, you'll see it come more laterally like this. That lateral piece is what's loading Preloading, pretensing the shoulder internal rotators. So as it turns out, this flip dynamic slot is really a way to maximize vertical or horizontal speed. That's a question, non-rhetorical. Vertical. The flip is going to allow me to preload the internal rotators. And in the previous slide, I said that was being pulled through. So that's how I'm getting my vertical. So this whole flip business is primarily to maximize the vertical speed component. And I can use as much or as little of it as I want. In fact, that's how you control the speed spin trajectory relationship on this forehand. If I don't want it to dip very far, I don't let it. If I want it to dip a lot, like you see Rafa, a lot of times out of the flip is perpendicular to the bloody court. Now that's going to set up a huge internal rotation. Is that why he has to boola loop it around? You tell me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And all these slides, and I've been experimenting with this person for about a month and a half, so okay. I'm a big fan. Good. And all these <laughs> slides, though, is pretty much open stance. Try to do that in a close stance. I find it to be a lot more difficult. Just interested in your opinion on that. Um, the open stance is meant to generally makes it easier to rotate the pelvis because right. it's an external rotation of, of, for the right hand or the right hip versus an internal rotation of the left hip and a close or square, whatever you want to call it. Can be done on both though. This this mechanism is really stance independent. It's grip independent. Adjustments have to be made by di these different things, but. Yep. I'd say the biggest challenge of teaching what way it is is relaxing enough at the back. Oh <laughs> man, you win the door prize. Can you get him like a beer or something? <laughs> yeah, that's right, man. Because once once you start pulling that thing forward, then you need to relax these muscles in order for the racket to turn the arm this way. And then you start to engage and going back the other way. That's like so it's a very relaxed thing. What I've found is that it's easy enough to tell them. Oh, the racket should be here, yeah. but then no. never relax. No, and that's the upper level. That's the upper level of all of this, like it is a performance of any kind, right? It's like, can you engage certain muscle groups and relax other ones at the same time? I mean, that's the key cornerstone of any great performance of anything. And you have to train to do that. Yeah, you can teach the motions. Teaching those muscular patterns, that's a different story. Yes. Yeah. Should we train uh, our place? Play double handed forehand? Two handed forehand? I really haven't looked at the two handed forehand a whole lot. I mean, I don't really even. I, I don't even. Would that be losing all this? Well, I can tell you it works very similarly in a two handed backhand. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to extrapolate to the two handed forehand, I've never even measured a two handed forehand okay. in 20 years. So, sorry. <laughs> I can't answer that. Okay. Well, I've been super crushed, but how do you train, the trick is how do you train those muscles to relax? Yeah, it's um, basically, basically, well, I don't know. Yeah, it's just repetition. You explain it. 
you put them in positions to relax it, you can use certain implements like a heavier object that makes it feel that the inertia is greater and it's just more active flip, yeah. I mean, that's where the art of coaching comes in, right? I can tell you what's happening, I can't tell you how to make it happen. Rick's better at that than me, for sure. I tend to just say, do it. <laughs> Rick, get off the play. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I don't think it. Yes, I can barely see you. What age, what level, I mean, when can you realistically introduce this? Okay, that, again, that's what was asked earlier. It's a coaching decision. I'll take any kid, now, well, knowing what I know now, I'll take any kid, any gender, of any age, and start building this in from day one. Yes? I introduce it from day one. Huh? I introduce it from day one. Perfect. And we agree then. If the guys in the end have it, increase the ball speed and pace, like 30, 40%. Yeah, and I can measure that. We've shown that yeah. time and time and time again. I agree. We agree on that. I got to move on, folks. We're running a little late here. Let's talk about the forward swing mechanics. And this uh, the, this one, um, one piece is obvious, and one's really kind of cool, I think. Uh, we'll see what you guys think. Um, from the forward swing, remember I said that this end of the back swing sets up a very direct path, and I said that that allows you to optimize the acceleration of the racket. So really I think of it um, mechanically as really the forward swing is really broken into two pieces. One is coming out of the dynamic slot. So I flip, flip, that aligns the racket with the hand. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so there's a period of essentially very straight motion like this, and then the racket starts to rotate into contact. Okay? So I break it up into the point where coming out of the flip, as the racket's rotating out, at what point is the racket perpendicular to the court? In other words, at what point is the tip of the racket and the butt end aligned between those two perpendicular to the baseline? And I call that the transition point. Because as it turns out, basically before the transition point, the forward swing is a very linear acceleration of the racket. After the transition point, transition point, it's a very rotational acceleration, angular acceleration of the racket. Let's see how those two pieces play out. So the force of the pull by the racket on the hand is well aligned with the shaft of the racket. Ah, you'd think I would figure it out. We're not too bright here. <coughs> Stick with me, now my pointer's not working. So this is the position coming out of the dynamic slot. Essentially the force is going to be something like this. This is an estimation, but if you can see the dynamic slot kind of pulls that rack right into the line of that force, which means I'm just kind of like pulling that thing along the butt end. Now tennis has been taught in tennis, point the butt end at the rack and all that kind of stuff, which it actually turns out to be a pretty good piece of advice, as long as that path is optimized. But the fact of the matter is, the butt end is going to point at the ball at any of these type swings. The question is, how long can that racket be dragged along the line of the pulling force? So you have to be a little bit more specific about it than that. It's not just the butt end, it's how the thing works. But essentially, once I come out of the flip, I'm in behind the hand, and I'm just essentially just pulling it along the optimized path for a period of time. Questions? That's a pretty good way to accelerate something, by, by the way. Yes? Really? He's saying any so that comes out this way too much. But is the hand path coming out here or is it cut and tight to the body? He's saying when he, when he says when he teaches that optimized path, the kids tend to spray the ball out to the right. So, um, and when, a lot of times if you teach that, they tend to, they t the arm tends to come out at too sharp of an angle this way. So if you watch them hit from behind, the actual path, the direct path is fairly close to the body. I mean, it's away. But a lot of times when you're teaching this, you'll have people out like this, forget that one, that ain't gonna work. So, I mean, when I say it's optimized, it's gotta be optimized, and it's gotta be optimized by the coach. Right, it's not gonna optimize itself. So this is in the rotational component. This one blows people's mind. Frankly, it blew my mind for a long time. Um, but now, I really like it. 
Um, so basically, at a certain point as I'm pulling that thing along, the, the racket starts to rotate into our, towards this contact configuration, right? And so as my hand's pulling forward, because it's attached to my shoulder, it has to start breaking a little bit to the inside like this, so it's not purely a linear path. Well, as it does, it starts pulling the racket in a little bit also, but from the grip. In physics, we call that a centripetal force, okay? And basically what's happening is, as I come out of the slot, my hand starts to pull into the inside, I'm creating a force on the butt end of the racket that looks like this now, instead of straight along. And because of the way that's oriented relative to the racket, the racket's going to want to tend to rotate in contact. Well, that's great because that's exactly where we want the racket to rotate in the contact, right? So, um, in theory, if I have this optimized path and I time it perfectly of when I break that transition point, and let the racket go, then I can get my angular acceleration into contact for free, essentially. Not totally free, because <laughs> I still need a lot of arm motion and all that kind of stuff. Um, but how does that happen in the type three swing? So as the centripetal force starts, to, as the force starts to turn in and become centripetal to the butt end of the racket, the racket's gonna want to rotate, but it'll only do so if I let some joint make it rotate. And in the ATP type 3 swing, it's the wrist. Uh-oh. Now we're going to have a big problem, <laughs> right? Because now we're going to get into, do you slap it? Well, actually, when you're teaching the type 3 swing to a lot of people and they're slapping it, it means they're using the wrist as the elastic return mechanism. But in the real ones, the good ones, the wrist is essentially a passive thing. So as the centripetal force pulls in, the wrist joint is allowed to rotate, and it's a fairly subtle 40, 45, 50. John says that it changes, that angle changes depending on if you're going down the line or across court, which makes sense, da 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 da, da. But the centripetal force turns it in, and I just let the wrist joint kind of swing open like a rusty gate in a way, hold the thought, until the racket becomes aligned. So really, the racket, the wrist becomes a control factor for the orientation of the racket at impact. Now, that's in a perfect world. What I measure most of the time with people with this type of swing is not that. They break that transition point at, at, at not quite the right time, and so the muscles around the wrist joint are actually acting in opposition to the direction of the wrist angular motion. So my wrist is actually going like this, I don't know if you can see it, to allow the centripetal force to do its job, the muscles are working in the opposite direction to slow the rate of that rotation and make sure the racket is aligned properly at impact. Questions? That one gets a little funky. So are you saying that in the ideal transition point, the racket is snapping the wrist? No. In the ideal transition point, what I'm saying is that the wrist motion that you see to allow the centripetal force to angularly rotate the racket um, can be done with no um, inhibition from the other muscles. It's a free hinge at that point. So the racket is moving the wrist as opposed to the wrist moving the racket. The racket, the wrist is allowing the racket to move in a passive relatively passive way. Now, people coming from the inside, for the, we haven't talked about the type two or type ones in a long time, they end up actually, me, I actually measure active wrist motion coming into contact. I've yet to measure anyone that has zero wrist. It's either, it's either forward or back, but you gotta watch this one then, because you'll get, especially boys, they get to 16, 17, they start feeling good about this, and instead of, instead of absorbing the flip, into the shoulder joint to return it as a, what we call a roll to give you the vertical speed. They'll accept the flip, which you can do. We don't want that as a wrist flexion or extension and return that as a flexion in an elastic return. And it's obvious, man. I mean, you it's just a snap and pop. It's an ugly thing to see. <laughs> and, but, and they can hit it real hard that way though. Don't get in front, don't get in front of it. 
I won't mention the name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what do we got? Yeah. It seems like the, the, when you slap, though, as you just alluded to, you can get a lot more power. Is the, is the concern uh, that you are not getting enough anterior shoulder rotation and also that's exactly the cause concern. for injury in the wrist? With the That's a concern, but the big one is from a performance perspective. From an injury perspective, that is a concern. From a performance perspective, the snapping of the wrist is going to interfere with your ability to generate vertical racket speed through internal rotation of the shoulder. It's a lot of fun, though, to slap. <laughs> slap away, man. I mean, go for it. Slap it. That's not what these guys are doing, though. Do you see when John was showing his high def? Uh, the doll is a great one to watch for this. Because he does have very muscular biceps, and you can watch the way that thing turns over coming into impact. I mean, it's just like, wow, a lot of people, it's really hard to tell. And I have very sophisticated methodologies to measure actually how this bone is turning based on the markers on the skin. But for him, man, it's just like, wow, that's one of his cool to see. Other questions? Yes? I found that um, too much pressure, the index finger is actually there's some motion of the racket relative to the hand and then there would be that factor. I mean, the fact of the matter is though, that what has the most range of motion to allow that centripetal force to it? So, okay, so, he, so what he's saying is that there's some motion of the racket relative to the hand, actually. So. <laughs> yeah, so there's an, an additional rotation not just from the wrist, but from the rack, and relative to the hand due to the soft tissues of the palm. And if you can enhance that by changing the pressure on the grip, then that would help, I agree. That's getting pretty minutiae, though, for me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna get a force transducer, and if you break this rule, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, um, basically there's slide adaptations to cover any range any height, you know, I mean, there's a whole litany of slight adjustments that you make to deal with anything that you would see on the court. I don't have time to get into all of those. Other questions? Okay, so player development implications. All right, well, here's the way I live my life. If muscle performance and arm path optimization are more important than strength of type three forehand is accessible to anyone with proper instruction, and I mean anyone. That's the way I live my life. That's my coaching decision. I believe that to be true with the deepest fiber of my soul. We have some evidence that this works at Rick's house down in Boca. Um, transformation from the type one to type three has been accomplished with players as young as six, boy and girl, with no loss in racket speed and enforced increase with speed quantified. Now, is it the right dude thing to do with everyone? That is a coaching philosophical decision for each person. I would never impose that on anyone. Based on the evidence and the way I know this thing works and I've seen it work with a bunch of age groups, I'm going to build this in early. Other people may tend to go with a more traditional kind of a swing and go to an evolution of the stroke. That's a coaching decision. My goal today was to try to explain a little bit about the physics of how this thing works. Because in fact, if you're going to teach this stroke, you need to know a little bit about how it works. Otherwise, you can take people down very bad roads. Questions? Yes, sir. So, at, right before impact, the wrist is relaxed enough that it has a rolling effect through impact. You get, uh, you're going to see that. You're going to see the wrist do this, right. but this is coming from the twist rotation. I'm sorry. This is coming from the twist, the, the internal rotation of the shoulder. It's just a transmission thing. The wrist doesn't have capability to do a twist rotation. Is that what you're talking about? Well, when you say the rolling, the whole arm is rolling right. from the shoulder joint. So that's what you're trying to enhance with the lateral component of the flip and then roll. You look confused. So, well, okay. <laughs> The wrist is the the wrist thing I'm talking about is a flexion extension kind of thing. If if you were gripping the racket like a lot of beginners do, way too hard, okay. that stroke would work. Uh, yeah, you want to be relaxed for sure. I mean, if you're gripping it so tight that you're locking out the motion of the wrist, 
which is possible because those right. tendons cross the wrist joint, then yeah, it's going to be a problem in getting that fine you know, angular acceleration. Is that where you're getting at? Yeah. So this this nice little passive hinge thing. Okay, the if you're gripping it super tight, but what I'm saying is what most people are doing is contracting the muscles in the other direction to slow the rate of that rotation. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying the key to not doing that is when does the racket stop becoming linear and start becoming angular? That's the trick. And that's what you want to play with. Yes. Yeah, because you, uh, there's a looseness that has to occur in order 